for those of you who couldn't hear, she's talking about in, in poor areas where violence is kind of a part of the regular daily thing and stuff. You got really, really good people, but how do you get out of it? How do you get out of that? And she said, some do, but many, it seems like impossible to get out. And it's so easy when you haven't been there, you mention people who are close to you. And those of us who may not have people close to us in those situations, really hard to, to connect and understand and to see it anything than one way. And you know, well, if you wanted to, I mean, here's, you know, and we, Barack Obama, or we pick up different examples and stuff like that, and we're like, that's wonderful, but that's not the reality for so many people. And I, I think that's really important, that parallel that you've drawn there is, is really important. And I think that makes Charlotte's words even more important, that I'm gonna get close to people I consider, that I haven't been, that I've been, I don't know, maybe afraid of even, but people I can get closer to. Thanks for sharing that, I appreciate it. I, um, I've only a couple of times gotten into some some uh, like juvenile facilities or prisons and things like that. And I always look at this story different through the lenses after I've spent time in some of those really hard places um, like that. Always when I, you know, I might spend a time at some place like Deerfield Academy, very privileged, and then spend time at an inner city school in South LA. And um, yeah, but this story, it does have and there's stuff from the, what the people of Rwanda have been through and are going through that I think really, I don't know, encourages me in so many situations. It's not the silver bullet, but I think it's a lot, a lot, yeah. No, no. That's exactly it. It, it's when we feel it that we begin to understand it. And that only comes from a, from a closeness, from an intimacy that doesn't. And I mean, you watch it and you think on oh, TV, oh, wow, I read a book or I saw a movie once or something. And, and they have their place without a doubt, but not until, I mean, that's why I felt so hard at times to explain to people why I stayed. You don't know how that young lady loved on our kids and that if you leave, she'll be killed. And if you stay, she might not be. So, yeah, it's not, it's really hard. There's, I used to talk about the head and the heart and the gap between the two. And, and, and like, this doesn't make head sense, but it makes heart sense. And that, that willingness to enter into the world of the other, I don't even like that term anymore either. But thank you. Thank you. You had a question. He said once I decided to stay and the plane left and I was there and actually the convoy of cars left. Um, I, uh, it's interesting too, right now, as I start to feel a little tightening inside, I tell myself, you, re you can remember this without reliving it. And I wanna just hijack for a moment. Um, it was when I finally got professional counseling that I, that I really started to come to learn the difference and to try, I've, I've searched around the internet. I call it dual perspective, but I, I haven't found, I'm sure somebody out there has it in the internet, but the reason I call it dual perspective is because I try now to go back to those stories. I mean, the natural way to go back is the 36 year old Carl. And you go back and you relive it and the emotions and the hormones, everything is going on, the knot in my stomach and stuff like that. Now I go back 65 year old Carl with 36 year old Carl to the, to the, um, to my driveway. When I said goodbye, I was barefoot. Um, I watched it wave, drive away. I was waving. I wanted my neighbors to see that I was not leaving. I was just hoping that that kindness and compassion they showed the foreigners might just help us in this situation. And so I go back there Actually, I haven't done that exercise here, so pardon, pardon me if I'm turning this into a therapy session, but, but basically the 65-year-old Carl is standing next to the 36-year-old Carl and saying, 
That was a good decision. It was hard. But damn, you've got an amazing wife. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I go there now in those memories with the tools that I have as a 65 year old. Stop and breathe. You're here at this high school talking with these kids who care about what's going on there. Center yourself, ground yourself, and go ahead and visit it together. And that way you can remember without reliving. And so some of what, what probably the 36-year-old Carl would have said back to the 65-year-old Carl is, eh, um, this isn't going to last long. Basically, I was throwing up every kind of denial. I'm not going to die. This is not going to last long. I said goodbye to Teresa thinking um, two weeks maximum. We can do this for two weeks. And probably in three weeks, you and the kids will be back. And um, three weeks and I hadn't even left my house. Three weeks and I still hadn't even put any shoes on for three weeks. And so as I think about what your question, what I was thinking and feeling at that time, um, I was definitely thinking about Teresa and the kids getting to safety. Um, and I was sort of in this denial, I think, of that. I, I don't think, I think it's the body's way of coping, you know. I'm, I'm not thinking I'm going to die. I'm not thinking I'm the only one. I'm not thinking I'm alone because I wasn't. I not only had those two people already in the house, the young man who came in the evening as watchman, the young lady who worked, but I invited a pastor and his wife to come. And those of you who saw the film, you met Pastor and Mrs. Soraya. And I invited them to come and, and join me in my house. And, and honestly, I never was alone. There were always people who were, um, I'm just like I said, a visual learner. Pastor and, and Mrs. Soraya, um, she's the one who would help us get food. She's the one who would go down to the gate. That beautiful smile would disarm the people who had come to harm us. She would talk to them like an auntie or a grandmother. And, um, and so I also think now, as I think back on it, courage is contagious. I know reading stories impacted the decision I made as a kid, whether they were stories from the Bible or whether they were stories from the Underground Railroad, um, the French resistance, World War II, you know, all of those stories, they would have all had an impact. But I think that, I think I also need to do a little more time with your question. I'll probably go do my own little journaling um, because they are, they're hard. And I think in these hard times, we don't recognize what a friend our emotions are. Now, I, I was a shop teacher, so you know, I compare it to lights on the dashboard. And they let me know when something needs attention and I need to listen to those things. But um, yeah, I, I guess from this perspective, I would say my feelings were feelings of denial. It's gonna be okay, it's gonna, we're gonna make it. It's gonna be all right, we're gonna make it. Thanks. Did I see someone with the hand? Yeah. Oh, thank you. You see a lot of qualities of Jesus that are important for you. Mm. God bless you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. My Thanks. question is. And you know, I, I, I appreciate you saying openly about that. I, make, I feel it's really important when I talk too about it that I just talk about it descriptively. That's, that's where I find my source of unconditional love. But I think there's so many places for people to find unconditional love and for us to, to be free to choose and not try to kind of, I think the reason I felt an urge to say something right now is I think so many times in Christianity, there's a, there's a sense of, a, of an agenda and trying to convince people of this or you should do that and that. And I feel really strongly um, religion should just be about connecting me with love and my neighbor. And that's where I would be basic. But anyway, didn't mean to hijack your comment or question. Thank you. How did you keep your faith in God and like humanity throughout? Um, OK, I'm looking at the clock. And I could, I could go on and on about this. His question was, how do you hang on to your faith about God and even trust in human nature or humanity? Um, I really have done a pretty serious rewiring I used to think about God, the strongest evidence of God in miracles. See a miracle, that's a strong evidence of God. Now I'm like, I believe God does miracles and stuff, but like 
90 percent of my evidence of the existence of God is like the neighbor lady standing in front of our gate. It's like Gasequa offering chickens. I think that God works through the choices of people, whether they identify with the word, the label, the name God or anything else. I believe in love. And I think that that love is seen not so much some superficial way, not superficial, supernatural way but also in the actions and choices of people. And so my question often, a lot of people say, well, where's God? If God is all powerful and all loving, why wouldn't God do anything? I reframe that question to say, where are the people who know love? And, and because if you don't know love, how can you expect people? And I mean, okay, that's for me coming out of the Bible. If you know love, you know God. If you don't know love, you don't know God. And so I would rather, though, in, in, in a, a broad setting, talk about love. And my, my, that, that just is empowering to me that I'm not looking for some supernatural, quote, miracle to happen. I have the ability in my choices to love somebody. And, and if I don't know unconditional love myself, it's really pretty hard. I really wrestled to love someone else. In, in deep, meaningful ways. I really wrestled when the psychologists, the other people were saying, you can't love anybody more than you love yourself. You have to love yourself before you, and I'm like, wait, I can love my kids more than I love me, but, but I now realize that if I do not value, and there's a difference between selfish and uh, a selfless love, but um, it has been that rewiring for me, and it's been through journaling that I've stayed connected to my understanding and my source of love um, through that. Religion, I, I, I get really angry at times at that, and yet I don't wanna throw it under the bus. My friend Omar, who I was telling you about, Omar's dad converted to Islam. On, the, on Fridays, his dad would take him to the mosque. On Sundays, his uncles would take him to the mosque. On Sundays, they would take him to mass. Omar was saying, you know, this, okay, cut it short, see if we have time for one more question. Omar was saying, religion doesn't own me, I own religion. And that really, that was just last Friday and I've been thinking a lot about that since then and I think about this sweater doesn't own me, I own this sweater. If this sweater is helpful and useful in the kind of person I wanna be, stay warm, whatever, or religion is helpful in, in being that kind of person of connecting to love and connecting to my neighbor, I will use it because I own that, but it doesn't own me. And that was, I thought that was a pretty amazing piece of wisdom. Thanks for that question. Do we have time for one more, Joe? I think we got one more else. Okay, please. Right. And you talked a little bit about coping, but um, in more detail, you know, how did you cope with your experiences and what was that like for you? So, um, and I really appreciate and respect General Dallaire for how openly he talks now about mental health and getting help. I just love that he, he, he makes himself vulnerable and he just spells it right out there. Like you said, there are times he wanted to end his life. And, and so for me, in this short period of time, um, journaling has been huge, and I think that's all part of introspection and just spending time with yourself and trying to uncover subconscious beliefs that we hold. Because I don't care if they're subconscious, they're still affecting my thinking and my actions. So journaling is a great way for me for processing. Finally getting past the stigma and going and talking to a counselor and spending time, getting tools, getting vocabulary, um, getting permission. Uh, to explore things and, and having somebody also help point out um, uh, inconsistencies or fallacies in my thinking. Wait, what pronoun did you just use? He said one time when I was telling him stuff. Having that kind of help, invaluable. And the last thing would be um, this idea of, of being able to talk safely and freely and not like bleeding all over the place, but when appropriate in a group like this to be able to talk safely with even a smaller group. My brothers are incredible friends. My wife is an amazing listener. So the crazy thing is, is when we need help the most is when we're least likely to ask for it or we seem powerless to ask for it. And that's why sometimes as close friends, we need to say, what can we do here? Let's talk, let's, let's, let's do that. It's led me then to be much more intentional about finding the good 
about um, developing neural pathways. I have control in many ways of the pathways I build in my brain. So the choices I make and recognizing I'm building pathways. First, I was working on pathways of gratitude for food. <laughs> it was an easy one. And then I'm like, hey, I can thank toll takers. Hey, I can thank TSA guys. Hey, I can, and I got a great TSA story, but thanks for that question. Hey, you guys, thank you. Thank you. I am. Um, I, I really appreciate your interest. If some of you have questions that you didn't get a chance to or you'd like to later or something, you can work through your teacher and stuff and email me or I, I've often told teachers, especially like today when I hog the microphone, that I'll be happy to make a little YouTube video to respond to some of your questions or we'll just do a Zoom or your teacher will just put their phone on speakerphone and I hope we'll talk and meet again. I fortunately, COVID, I got out of the habit, but um, I finally started to remember again to bring books with me. I wish these are these are about um, the three months of the genocide. So if you saw the film, this is like an expanded version of that. This is not about the restorative journey of Rwanda. I hope something will come someday in that area. So this is just about 94. If you'd like, welcome to take a copy. If you can make a contribution, there's a website in the back, $5 or whatever, just to help books keep going to other schools. But if you just want to take it and read it and give it to somebody else, that could be your contribution. So there's a stack of them, um, Joe, right in the back yeah, there. Right the back the so thanks. Who do I give the microphone back to? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Griffin Stacy, a senior here. Um, We'd just like to thank everyone again for coming and being such a great audience. Um, and if you would uh, join me, we could also thank Carl one more time for being such a great speaker. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story uh, and teaching us about your experiences in Rwanda. And on behalf of Mr. Goldman's genocide class, um, we'd like to ask that everyone here continues to think of these ideas and have these conversations uh, even after you leave the library today. Um, if you have any more questions or want to find more information, uh, there's another talk at 4 o'clock at the Dodd Center today. Uh, so you're highly encouraged to go join that talk at 4 o'clock. So have a great day. Thank you so much.